First, Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont are wrapping up a major collaboration this spring to collar and study moose. The study began in 2014 in western Maine and in 2016 spread into northern Maine. The goal was to learn more about fluctuating populations of our moose, what makes them thrive, what has killed off large quantities. At times, the results have been surprising. So I sat down with the state's moose biologist to talk about what's come from the study and whether New England can actually do more to protect moose, an answer that may seem counterintuitive. You know, we've done 600, we did 605 moose to date, right? The majority of those captures are done with a helicopter, a low level flying where they shoot out a net gun. So it tangles the moose up, they land the helicopter, they get out, they hobble the moose so the four legs are together and they blindfold it. And once the moose is blindfolded, it's pretty sedate. So there's no drugs involved. This year we tried something new. So this is a collar that went on a calf. So we, we pad the collar, so as that calf grows and this deteriorates, uh, it has more room. But we also made this, see how this stretches out? Oh yeah. So this stretches out with the surgical tubing, and then what's going to happen with these moose is that probably in less than a year, the surgical tubing will rot and this collar will fall off. It only takes a winter of data to help Maine's moose biologist Lee Cantor better understand populations. In Maine, we have a unique technique that we used where we caught 25 moose in the water. That's like a nice bowl. So we basically drive up alongside of them while they're swimming, pull her back, do the ear tags, and then I have a little quick release that I do and then she's off and swimming. Well, what quickly happened is that the first year we lost a bunch of our collar calves to what appeared pretty quickly to us to be winter tick, having this uh, onslaught of winter ticks that drained the blood off of a 400 pound moose. In five of those six years, we had more than half of our collared calves die from winter ticks, more than half. When a collared moose Other hasn't moose moved in six hours, Cantor gets a text alert it's that it's impressive. likely dead. In the hour that we were at his office, he received two of those texts. But what we've seen in the last seven years of our study is that winter tick, what it does is, I mean, if you have a calf, if you have calves dying, they can't make it to their first year of life in May. So they're born in May, they come through their first winter, and then with the onslaught of ticks in March and April, that kills the calf, right? So we've done a number of stories about the tick population and, and it moving north. The winter tick is a different tick because all of its life stages all happen on one animal in the course of one year. So like the deer ticks and all those get on a host, get off, spend the summer someplace else, get on another host. But the winter tick is lives for one year and it's all in the back of a moose or whatever else runs into it in the fall. So now you have the, the one tick taking all its blood at three different stages on one animal. And that's what's so insidious about it. So what happens is these moose get as many as 60 to 90,000 ticks on them, right? When the ticks are feeding in March and April, the female alone, just one female, can take one mil of blood, okay? One mil. I mean, they're losing so much blood from being um, fed on by the ticks that they can't the moose cannot replace that blood fast enough. Why the increase in winter ticks? Well, Cantor says a changing climate isn't helping. If it's a mild start to winter, which it has been lately, winter ticks stay higher on the brush with easier access to whatever's walking by. So where do we go from here? Where do you go with th these results? The answer is a difficult one because there is no easy solutions. You cannot go out there and start spraying all of northern Maine to kill ticks, right? Because if you do that, you're going to kill everything that's out there. And, and moose live in a huge private forest in Maine that's not owned by the state of Maine. So then people always ask me, well, you, know, you guys use these helicopters and you catch this moose. Why don't you put a collar on it, you know, like you do with your dog? And the interesting thing there is, well, let's say you could even do that on one moose. That, you know, it's a, it's a big cost. But beside that, we don't know the right pesticide that you would put on a moose. We don't, it's not, it's not my dog that I have in my house where I can give my dog a pill every month. And I'm not making fun of people who have asked this. It's an important question, but it's not a feasible way to do things. And it's really interesting because our friends and neighbors in Quebec are doing a similar study that they started a year ago. And at their study, they initially caught 
calves like we did, and they treated half of their calves with something to kill the ticks, it didn't work. Mm. They all still had ticks on them. And so what we're advocating for doing in a very small area is to increase the harvest of moose in an area to actually manipulate that population and bring that population even lower to try and break the tick cycle. So you can see the problem here, which is people see less moose and then they say, you want to kill more moose, but we don't know ultimately what that will do. I think it's going to be fascinating in another 10 years to see how this plays out. I mean, the fact that they want to lower the population to try to kill down the population of those ticks, it, it makes sense, but... It's a real challenge because every time you move a piece on the chessboard, it changes the overall game right. and the, you know, there are consequences often unforeseen. I mean, I know something about the toll that ticks take on moose, but I had no idea 60 to 90,000 ticks on one moose. Yeah, it's upsetting. And those images are disgusting. But I mean, we have seen our own tick population grow in years. And yeah. it's fascinating to see what's happening in Western Maine and Northern Maine in the woods. You know what's also cool is the ingenuity that goes into simply, you know, getting the moose so that they can study them. What they do with, along the water there, I thought that was really interesting, in the boats, and then of course with the, the lassoes from the helicopters, whoever came up with these ideas in the first place, really smart. Also, how cool are moose that they can swim too? Yeah, and I mean, we all love moose, so we all have an interest in this. <laughs> By the way, you can find more information about this study on the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife website. We have shared a link to that on our website and our mobile app. And one more note, Lee did ask us to mention, do not mess with moose out in the wild, especially if you see one swimming along your boat. Leave them alone.